phase, you know, I would have tried to solve it, what the solution actually is, is lessons learned, and wrap up some final thoughts on the unit. And by the way, that's the nature of the private cloud you're trying to be in. Right? You're going to try to teach happy, peaceful, no servers crashing. It's all good. Okay. Uh, I think I've got 25 years of software development experience. I've been in my new world services, uh, GE, Anthem. I started this whole thing company back in 98. And so much places like Ericsson and Ford, and the computer based business. Small and medium sized things. So I've seen a lot of different product software. Uh, Open Logic, I founded the company to help with open source support. So a lot of things you're going to see today are based on open source. Actually, all of it is based on open source. And we actually have open source. SLA support on over 500 packages. And you can go to os.oplogic.com, free site. We've got information on over 350,000 open source packages. You can submit information and search and slice and dice. And what's behind that is things like solar in the new space space and behind other partner services. So a lot of enterprise customers can get access. Okay, so the problem I'm trying to solve is a big data problem, which is why you want to do this things like HBase, right? And our problem is we need to put all the world's open source somewhere so we can find it, slice it, dice it, and search it. And some of the information we put in there is metadata about every one of the files, right, where it came from, where the licenses involved, and every single line of code, and every single version of every single package we can get, all indexed. So we have individual tables in HBase that are many, many, many terabyte size, billions of rows. Uh, and relational databases are scale free. So we can just plug it in on the machine and instantly, okay, I can now massively rewrite all that. I've got to jump through a lot of hoops to make that happen, either on the read or the right side. Whereas with things like HBase, you don't really have to worry about it. You just play the machine and just. It's growing every day. Open source doesn't stop. It doesn't sleep for anybody. You know, you can look at GitHub and see the kind of numbers it's there. You can put up daily and new projects or source board or whatever. Everywhere else in the world. And we have to have both real time random access to all this data for our scanning solution. And what that is, is we have a, a tool we sell enterprises that lets them scan their own code base and determine if there's open source in it. So the developers copy and paste it into the code that's open source into your proprietary software, and then you go sell it. And guess what? It's about the GPL. Now you use this GPL as your product. So that's kind of important. And even if it's not GPL, you need to comply with open source licenses. So a lot of companies don't realize that this is happening every day. Developers put in code, they use a whole project, don't tell anybody, or there's a lot of crazy flavors and cases we find the word they get little chunks of code to get in. And now there's an issue, it's usually an internal whistleblower or FSF has gotten involved, it's been a lot of people. So it's an important problem we need to solve. But in order to solve that, solve that you have to have every single individual line of code. And by the way, you can tweak variable names and try to cheat. So you have to you have to index every one of those lines of code in different ways. So abstract out things like variable names and comments and all that. So it's a lot. It really is big data. So it's random access because we don't know what people are going to scan and what might be found. So we have to very quickly be able to say, well, let me analyze your chunk of code compared against billions and billions of rows and lines of code in the database and immediately we can response. A response and we're talking about you know, 20, 30 milliseconds back response. So that's the random access side. And then we also do long running complex analysis jobs with Hadoop, where we're looking for trends across open source projects and packages, what licenses are becoming more common, you know, how fast the code base is growing, what are enterprises doing, what kinds of things are they finding. So both real time, fast access, and long running, and we want to do that in one system. So not a trivial problem. And the solution involves a combination of Hadoop, HBase, and Solar. So just quickly, most people aren't very familiar with it. Hadoop is essentially gives you a, a distributed file system with map reduced capability. A lot more than that, that's, that's a pretty good base. On top of that is a whole set of related projects in Apache Software Foundation that let you analyze and slice and dice and put things like HBase on top of that file. And HBase gives you a column-oriented NoSQL data store to think kind of fancy key value here. A little more than that, but that's the basic goal for it. You're not going to do any queries. You're essentially going to do gets by primary key. That's what you get. But it's 
scales very, very well. And if you want more storage, you want more performance, you want parallel queries to happen, plug it in the machine, make it part of the cluster, and it's something that's getting along pretty quick. We do use solar, which for people who don't know what solar is, it's a search server based on the scheme. And so what this gives you is a standalone server that you can hit with REST. Um, it, it will accept JSON and XML and Ruby formats, a bunch of different formats, both going in and coming out. You can add data to images and query them with pretty complex queries very, very quickly. And it also scales pretty well. So we use that to do a lot of the searching. And all these guys are scalable, fast, well supported, enterprise ready, and in production. But those aren't the only thing. And there's really a supporting cast of thousands when you look at everything that these guys require to include the clean these cleanings projects and the things that you use around them. Things like Stargate, which is a REST server in front of HBase. So similar to Solar, you can just hit it with REST and get things out of HBase, put things in, and update things. So that means it might go ahead and use whatever kind of code, whatever language you want, and you can get data in and uh, get back out. SQL, Rails, Redis. Anybody use Redis in here? I haven't heard a lot of people talking about Redis at the show so far, which is interesting. Uh, Redis is really cool. It's a very, very fast, which you might think of as a data structure server. So as opposed to just a, a key value pair kind of thing, it lets you store lists, get, sorted, set, hash map, things like that, and operate on them very quickly. And by very quickly, I mean about 110,000 writes per second, roughly. So it's in memory store and then it uh, asynchronously writes to this, or you can have it write to this ahead of time. That's very, very fast. And it makes things like locking and, and sharing queues and things like that across the whole machine very easy, very fast, and atomic. That's nice. So lots of goodies there, and I'll talk about some more of those as we go along. Okay, so what our solution architecture looks like. We have web browsers and scanner clients that come in through Nginx and Uniform. We used to use Apache. Uh, we actually switched to Nginx. It turned out to be a little bit better for our use case in working with Uniform. If you're not familiar with Uniform, think of it kind of like an app server for Rails. So it, it makes it fairly easy to scale Rails across processes and then to watch them automatically, kill them, restart them, maintain them. Uh, so it's fast, quick, reliable, um, scales pretty decently, and it works very well with tag team to take the request. Nginx gives you caching in a reverse proxy and using for and expect very, very fast clients and Nginx acts as a client in this case. So they work well together. So those take in the sort of frontline request, pass it on to Ruby on Rails. Uh, unlike the, uh, the case from Yelp group we just heard from people in the room, we don't have a Ruby and Ink current log on in a second. So it's not quite that kind of scale to deal with and we don't have any problems with scaling rails to our needs. We do use MySQL with live replication to store the bulk of data about our enterprise customers and authentication and that kind of thing. So we put requests into MySQL, get data out. We use Redis for, as I mentioned, or alluded to, our queuing mechanism. So these lists that it can keep track of and atomically add things to a list, take things off, we can use as a queue. And there's a, a wrapper functionality called Rescue that we use on top of that. And so Ruby on Rails, when it has a job to do, like a scanning job, it comes in where it says, process this code, you know, hit, hit H base and solar and look up all this data and give me an answer. It throws one of those jobs on the QA secretly so it can quickly return to the scanning client and say, okay, I got that, move along. So then asynchronously, we have this batch of these rescue workers that are looking at the Q in Redis, pulling off the next job and processing it. And the way it does that is it hits the button on the remote. No more fancy remote control technology for me, I guess. Uh, it hits solar. And so the cluster of solar servers can look up and say, okay, if they're matched, do you have anything that um, matches this particular line of code or this file in the open source database? If I get a hit, then I go to Stargate, which is this REST server that sits in front of the HBase. Okay, now give me the actual matching data. Give me the file of the open source project and all the metadata belonging to it from HBase. And because HBase is on Hadoop, you get the default free edge replication factor across all your data. Uh, and we'll talk about what implications that has on the deployment later. And then 
then it, the rest of the world just puts the final results back to my people, their figures, and what was found so that on the rails client, I can see what was found and we can work on that. And then I thought, well, I have to see what I can And then finally, we have the maven client, because um, we actually store a maven rate code on in our certified library that we can use instead of just an IBM data or somewhere else. So that kind of calls us to the same uh, policies and, and tracking that we run into the OOP. Okay, so that's what it looks like. So implementation wise, um, you can think of it as a private cloud and for competitive purposes that came about exact details, but it's well over 100 cores, well over 100 terabytes of disk, and the machines don't have identity. They all have exactly the same software, they're configured exactly the same way, same OS, same disk layout. You just basically plug it into any window and now they can do anything we need to know to do, like on solar or anything or do or any of the other parts. So why not Amazon for something like this? Well, it turns out Amazon and AC2 are great for computational parts, but it's pretty expensive for long-term big data storage. And I'll, I'll go through some of the economics of that in a bit. Also, it's not quite consistent enough for mission-critical uses to finish space. If you look at the mailing list and, and the people who have tried to do that on EC2, HPACE is pretty sensitive to latency issues and spikes because it uses an underlying technology called Zookeeper, and Zookeeper is all about coordinating a cluster machine in memory so it can determine what's up, what's down, and both are saying, okay, well, that guy's not responding correctly, we're going to vote him out. Here's a new master, and this is how we can control. Well, Zookeeper is very latency sensitive, and what happens is if you have a spike, like you can see on EC2, it's you know, 100 milliseconds, Zookeeper will say, oh, well, that guy's offline, we're going to start shutting him down, and bring somebody else up, vote in a new master, and then, oh, well, he just popped back up. Well, okay, now we got to shuffle things around again, so you can see the message crash. Really bad for Zookeeper, which is then in turn really bad for HBase. They're not, not quite there yet. People are trying it, but I wouldn't invite them. So you're, you're pretty cloud storm, you can go that route. So be extra cautious if you're going to use HBase at any time kind of a public cloud. Okay, top 10 lessons learned, and not to give it all away, I've given it some more time. So configuration is key, and there are a lot of moving parts. That's the downside to kind of solutions. And the details matter. So things on the operating system, like how many maximum files can I own? What about sockets? How much memory do I need to keep sockets? Uh, do I have any user-specific limits to the OS about open handles and things? And yeah, we can tune those. I'll talk about some of the most important ones in a few minutes. But there's a lot of you have to pay attention to them. You can't sort of gloss over and say, well, I'll get to that later after development. When we go live, I'll come back to mention that because it will bite you. Uh, for Hadoop, you've got to set the maximum number of both map and reduced jobs, how much memory you're going to give it, how much disk you're going to give it. In H base, there's something called region size, and that's essentially the, the individual chunk of data or disk that it uses and manages. And so it's set to something like 64 meg or 128 meg by default. And that's assumed to hold a decent number of rows in H base. If it doesn't, and I'll come back to this later, if you have really big values in those rows, you'll essentially be using HBase in a way the designers didn't intend, which means it can still work, but you can have interesting latency issues, storage spikes, and sometimes it's really so I'll come back to that. Uh, memory is also important for HBase. You don't want to starve this guy. Memory is swap well, really dead. Solar, there's a couple of interesting values. One called a merge factor, and that's related to the number of indexes. Solar will manage. So if you have a small merge factor, it means you have a smaller number of indexes, which means when you're writing data, it has to spend more time compressing and, and grouping them together into smaller indexes. So when you're writing, it's, it's better to have more of them. When you're reading, however, it has to read from each one of the indexes and aggregate and return your results, which is sure that you have to balance by reading more and writing more. Uh, again, memory also important. And norms, that's something solar stores related to. If I have a lot of search queries that I want to get back to things like lots of documents with highlighted text, where the highlights match where the user sent in as a term, the norm can help you very quickly do that. However, if that's not what you need to do, if that's not your use case, if it's not how 
and they just take up memory, they take up a lot of space on the disk, and they put things down. So use case is very important for all these guys. You need to think a lot about how you're using the system in a number of ways. Minor version is very important. So Hadoop is, you know, think of it in terms of roughly the 0.20.1 version. It's like, wow, that's pretty early. You know, counting really how small you know, it's around here. It turns out it's very stable. But there's minor versions like the 0 0.20.1, the 0.20.2 is huge, very significant. And the same goes for HBase, which is on a 0.20.6 right now. Well, and with development of 0.89, they're making a big business jump for 0.20. Uh, it turns out that those minor versions go together very well, or not at all, or kind of. And so what you want to do if you're using HBase, I would tend to ignore mainly the recommendations of the Hadoop community because HBase is on top and they have very specific needs. So choose your version of each phase you want based on the features of the building where you're comfortable. And then pick what they say is the most compatible version of the new use with it. And what happens if you just say, well, okay, I'm using dot 20 dot x actually works. Most most people on the internet if you Google for it say, oh you're you're pretty much good. Yeah, you're pretty much good, that's right. And if you really enjoy 14 hour buggy sessions, which go for it. If you don't, pick the versions that match. Find print matters and things like specific patches count too. So if you choose H base 0.20.6, they may say use the new 0.20.1 with these three patches applied. So it's not as mature as we like to use this one. We really have to do some unpleasant things in a very stable environment. Now once you do all this, it works well in spite of If you don't do some of these things, it will, it will hurt you. Okay. Specific recommendations. There's a lot of H based configuration advice on their wiki, and that involves everything from the ground up. The OS, all the socket settings, open file settings, patches applied to Linux, what kernels you could use, all the H, uh, all the Hadoop configuration and the H based configuration. There's a lot of kind of sucks. And it's very tempting to say that looks like that doesn't apply to me and all I'm probably good, I got to like the kernel one. You kind of gloss over some of those. Yeah, don't, you won't enjoy the outcome if you do that. Because it'll, you'll be fine in production or in, in development for a long time. You'll go to production and you'll fall over immediately. So skip steps that you're in peril. If you need HA to do, you might think, well, on HA to do, isn't that redundant? Isn't that the entire point of the Well, it turns out there are a couple single points of failure actually in the do. Uh, one, the primary one, is called the name node. And this is one box that has a memory basically map of where all your files live on the cluster on HTFS and do the three files. And so if that guy goes down, you actually, the cluster doesn't know where any of the files are. So if any of the nodes already have some information about files and cache, they're good. As soon as they go to something new, they're not so good. So this is kind of the one box that you want to use a little more hardware redundancy, maybe some frame setup, extra power supply, that kind of stuff. Because generally on the cluster, you don't care about it. It has no fault ever. So what? The main node is the, is the special case. If you really don't like that at all, and you don't want to go to production, but even though places like Joplin have been doing it for years, and multi thousand node clusters, you can do it. Um, it's in the words, it's in development to be a more standard setting. But it's not standard yet, and you have to know what you're supposed to do to get there to do it. Uh, one specific note, if you hit base note and time out where you're writing some sockets, and this is something we actually did in the project, and the advice is conflicting, a little bit vague, a little bit hard to find, uh, and sometimes downright wrong. So we found out the way to set this data node socket time out thing to zero. Even though a lot of people say it should be ignored and that slack doesn't do anything, it actually causes some of the new network to go to a different path. And that path is more better. If you don't run into this problem, then apparently you don't need to set this as a web tablet here. Which sounds suspicious to me, but we did hit it. But that'll give you some time. Uh, Linux kernel is also important. Uh, it, which specific version of the kernel you have affects some of the settings you'll make. 
So for example, there's something called an equal limit that was introduced only in Rule 2627, where when they introduced it, it had very low value. And so when you ran a decent sized new cluster and pound on it, it tends to hang, kind of lock up and fall over and say things like you're out of socket. When you look at socket settings, they don't know it's got like 2 billion of them or something. Uh, it turns out there's this other equal setting under the cover that you can pop up. But then in a newer kernel, I have the 2633 plus, they bump up those limits so I don't think it's the best of them. So again, it's kind of specific. So if you're on something like Rel5 and Top 5, you can have an older kernel that's actually before the 2627, you will get this, which means this octopus you saw Brian think this morning is lurking out there waiting to be tracked with the upgrade. So you might want to go ahead and bump that up if you're using an older kernel. Or put the setting in the file you want to see more for now. Another thing, which again to echo back to Brian's talk this morning, a lot of problems with BIOS. They're bitten by network BIOS, network card BIOS, hardware drivers, all those still be things you don't think you have to mess with or explore them. And we kept running into problems with brand new Dell boxes, CentOS 5, RHEL 5, Broadcom NIST, which is a default network card they put in it on the motherboard, where you get weird drop packets and other problems, but only under high load for your convenience, which means it's really, really hard to debug. And so the, the great story here is that you know, they're trying to be green, so they're trying to use power saving mode. There's a number of power saving things on, on the Dell BIOS, the motherboard, and also on the NICs. And what happens is they kind of work together and say, well, when you're, you're idle and your system's not doing anything, we can really just kind of back you down to low power mode, and then when you go to get your network card again, we'll kind of write that back up for you, kind of on the fly, you don't have to worry about it. Until you get the interesting working firmware bug or driver bug in there that says, you know what, you're, you're at the peak load, you didn't count as a hell of a box about eight hours solid. And Throttling everything you can. Looks idle to me. Shut it down. So it literally just turns off your network card in the middle of your absolute convenience mode. Just goes away and says, We're going to be green for you. Really convenient. So it means that this is really hard to debug because you have to throttling the hell out of your system to see it, and then you don't know why it's inside. So we found out there's a combination of things. One is there's this MSI thing, setting the limits that you need to disable. There's a, another set of things related to Dell C state, which is a key by multiple other turn it all off. If you leave any of it on, it will fight you. It will suddenly idle something when you're in peak mode and, and hurt it. So that was fun. And by the way, Dell doesn't admit this is a problem with this morning. Essentially, it says in this version of JRE, 
on Linux, um, there's a bug, and it's perfectly acceptable to consider frequency zero like the text says it should. And hey, by the way, if anybody out there sees this exception that says resource compared to is unavailable, let us know. And once we go to JTK 7, everything will be good. We'll fix this bug. So it's kind of an example of the really esoteric cases that they do get because it's counting the Java network you code so far. It's going to squeeze out every weird corner case and expose all the cracks. So it's important to reuse exactly the most recommended versions. And by the way, this was actually fixed in 1.6.0.18 after only six years of being put in the sun. So you jump right on this one. Uh, and so that means the comment about GTK7 is not quite right, right now. And so if you look at HBase and the community and what they recommend, there's not just specific recommendations about what to do to use and what other things to use, but also which JDK. And they don't just say something like use JDK 1.6. No, no. It's use JDK 1.6.0.20, but not 0.19 or 0.17. And by the way, 14 is more stable than 15. That's the kind of level of recommendation you're going to get. But they are absolutely throttling every little part of the corner case above. So make sure you pay very close attention to the most recommended version of the JTK for the version of the new with the version of HBase, they go together. Sorry, question. So, yeah. so when we recommend HBase, I'm wrong. I'm recommending either of those. Okay. I'm recommending get the latest, highly recommended tax version of the JTK to go with the version of HBase we choose, which will also drive the new computer. So they go together. So it's not always the latest, it's not always the oldest, it changes. Yes. <laughs> so the comment was, that's always true. And I would say, uh, I've seen some interesting accounts where that's not necessarily true. I guess this one is, is particularly interesting. Yes, it's true. Yeah, I, I can say that there's a lot of system mixed out there and the community has some that tend to be a little exuberant, let's say, to apply the latest version when it comes out. It's not always a good idea, especially when you're dealing with this kind of system. Okay, so you may have heard that a new runs on commodity hardware. This is true, but this picture, if you can see it, is not what they need. Don't break through the attic or look at the basement or, or find that old. Commodore 64 and try to look it up. It's not what they're talking about. It's not talking about three year old desktop lying around in the closet on your desk either. It's talking about rack mounted modern machines. The same tool, block boards, and two gig of RAM for this kind of machine. That's the commodity hardware we're talking about. Um, one note don't bother with RAID on the new data disk, and that's because it already has a free X redundant mechanism in ETFS for every block. Basically, it's written to at least three disks, and they're across machines and even across racks instead of clustered that way. However, be wary of non enterprise drives. Um, if you put consumer drives in there, you're going to have vibration issues and they will go down a lot more frequently than you might. Uh, we use uh, enterprise gigabyte better drives that have actually been fine for us. Cross my fingers, but it's been good. A lot less vibration issues. So you can expect early hardware issues at some point. You're going to run into every kind of failure you can imagine. I'll come back to that. So here's what our actual deployment looks like. We use dual quad core and hex core mailboxes, 32 to 64 gig RAM. We do use ECD RAM, so I can say it's that quantity. Well, it's a little more expensive, but it's still commodity, and it's actually highly recommended by Google in their clusters. And I think it makes a lot of sense when you're running terabytes and terabytes of data through your RAM, even odd things like RAM failing and having a weird bit is not what you want to debug. It's not a fun process. So ECC RAM will cut down on that dramatically. Uh, we do use six two terabyte enterprise drives or box. Now I just said don't use RAM one on the new node. So I'm going to sort of contradict myself and say we do change two of the drives and put RAM one on them because that's where we put the OS, the Hadoop software, HBase. Solar, job code, lots of other stuff. And I'll come back to the end of in a minute. And key source data backups. So this is where we have our, the data that we load 
into a new, we actually have it sitting right at the top for easy access, quick reloads, and it's just a nice place on the cluster to put things while we're developing. So maybe it's a little overkill, but it makes it feel a little more comfortable. And then I do get a node and get the other four tries to basically go and say, okay, do your HTMS thing on that and manage this for. We do use redundant enterprise switches in normal and quad unit and NICs because Hadoop and friends love bandwidth. They crave it. You want the biggest bite you can get. And the reason why is Hadoop, when you're running MapReduce jobs, it shuffles a lot of data around. So when you give it a big job, MapReduce, the way it works is you decompose a big job into little pieces, you map them out to your cluster, you spray them across all the nodes, and it does some crunching, and you basically reduce the answer back. So this mapping and reducing when it's AD, uh, DMS is going, is copying lots and lots across your cluster, across machines, across drives on the same machine, and across racks. And that takes a lot of bandwidth. We talk about you know, thousands or tens of thousands of different uh, processes, all grabbing 64 or 128 meg blocks thrown around. So even in a data network for mail there, you can count on it. And even when you're not directly running jobs, <coughs> continuously replicating blocks and rebalancing because it's trying to get used to that free extra location factor. So every time you wait out a block in the background and setting up jobs, we go replicate that. And that happens at the same time you're running your map reduce jobs because your map reduce jobs are probably generating data. So again, a lot of bandwidth. So more to better on your network. Your name is in. HBase also wants bandwidth. In, in addition, it needs about five machines to even stretch its legs. So when you first plan on this development, you can set up all your laptops on the dev machine, and that works. But you're not going to see much interesting performance or really start to kick in it. It looks really nice to see it up there. Machine. Five machines to film. And I did mention it depends on Zookeeper load latency. Do not let them swap. Don't let Zookeeper or HBase swap or more. So I'll show you. It'll start thinking machines going down. And so that was fun. Uh, some people even recommend you set your like, swappiness to zero. So basically, it's still layout, it's still the OS, it's still for that. We found that hasn't been necessary when we have to do deeper higher boxes. You just watch how many current after this job you run. That has to limit an issue. Yeah, question? It does not enable swap now, but it, it reduces the amount of swap that's supposed to happen in ordinary terms. Uh, the question is, under what circumstances would it be reasonable to swap? Like I said, we actually don't set swappiness to zero because we haven't found it to be an issue. I have seen other people recommend it. I'm not sure if it's a good idea or not. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess the problem is, you turn off swap entirely, you basically threw away your insurance. It, in case you do have little spikes that, that go up and they come down. Because we found that. I think mainly the people recommend that are worried about things like when you try this on EC2 or when you try this on underpowered machines and you tend to hit swap that doesn't last a second or two, you tend to hit swap that lasts two minutes, and then you run into a lot of problems. We've actually been in the swap when we had jobs run out of control or you know, we messed something up. It's like, oh crap, we're in swap and it's using six k to swap and it's, it does that for a minute and nothing really goes wrong. But I think the recommendation is if that's a normal situation for you, if that's how you run the cluster, you're going to you're gonna screw yourself. So try to avoid it. We found it just putting enough horsepower and memory in it, and even if it's possible, you should play the service. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's what we do. We can come back to it in a few minutes here. Okay, uh, another thing is big data. If you're not used to it, it takes a long time. Long time to do what? Long time to do anything at all. Uh, to load it, list it, walk the directory structure, just to count the data you have, run any process around it, test it to back up, it takes forever. It, it, I'm really not kidding here. I mean, you're talking about doing something like a find dot or ls dash lr something on your box, and think, oh yeah, that, that takes a few minutes. Okay, and it really, really like it's fast. And how big does your data have to be to not get that fast? Well, you, know, you have your ls, I don't think you can see that picture very well. You've got the Starship Enterprise. Took a long before 10 by trying to look at the list of 
Bible. But you need to traverse this. Anybody know what that picture is? That's the fish pond. Probably can't see it very well. It's the Plum Observatory picture in the July of the entire universe. Which I don't know how far you have to see it back if you can't take that picture and put this book. If you're going to warp 10, but you cross the entire universe and you go dead slow. So it will take forever. And I'm talking about forever meaning just do a find or an LS or something like that and cross drive. And 48 hours later, again, it's still the first point about what they didn't know you got vacated. But don't think anything is reasonable to sit in front of them without parallel things. You, you can't do anything one at a time with it. Um, it's hard to test because it's so big. It's really something to skip it. But if you do, then you'll just run into the issues of stuff. Officially, you're going to get every corner case you know and you don't know. And a lot of those are. You know, in your own data, you'll find the weirdest things about you know, the equivalent of people with domains and addresses that don't exist. Just bizarre stuff. You take these from anybody else, you, you get an API, you get data, you scrape it, you load it from source data, just bizarre things you would never even imagine happening. So you want to test on as much of that real life data as you can get hold of. At least have it fail and develop it and debug for hours on it and kick yourself if it's all good. Uh, backups are pretty hard because this is so big. They might even want a second Hadoop cluster just for backup. It's kind of expensive, but it's a heck of a lot faster and a lot safer than trying to do it any other way. Just do things back up and lock it without something like that. They are working on live replication for eight phase. That's what the So you can even back up across data centers and get the idea. Not quite fully baked yet, probably usable. Um, we're not uh, trying to take advantage of that yet. It's a little new. Um, Solar does have built in replication. We use that and it works quite well. So some of these things you can do, you can have uh, live replication under backup. Now we're still a little bit immature. So some advice on how to get this big data in there if it's so big it takes you long when you do. One thing not to do is don't use a single machine to load it. And you know, the reason being is they have to live long enough to actually see the finish. It will take forever. Uh, so don't collect what we do is we actually spread our raw source data across a lot of drives, a lot of machines, and then we actually have NFS accounts that we can access. And by the way, you want to be very careful with that because if you figure it's important, if the machine goes down, which is very common in the cluster, you don't want to hang all of NFS, you want to basically take all the machines down. <laughs> So there's a number of settings you can put in as a key type mode and they ignore the other guy type mode where well if it went away, you just can access it versus you know, having a demon just hang and take you down. So once you've got this spread out, now you can actually load your raw data into a base with a new map reduce job. It's great. And if you're gonna do that, there's a setting in H base called the wall, it's a right hand wall. So typically whenever you put new data in H base, it writes to the wall first. So then it can recover it. You know, the database goes down before that that data gets written, which is great for normal operations, but really slow and painful for initial to load a big data. So I recommend you just turn that off, get all your first load in, and then you can turn it back on for your normal operations operation a lot faster. Of course, if something is wrong, we may have to turn over your load. Um, I mentioned this before to avoid large values. I'm talking about like over five meg. Now these are single values, so in eight phase you've got rows and columns. And a value is inside of a single row, inside of a single column, for a particular time stamp, I have a value. Don't make that too big. And the reason why again is because the designers of eight phase don't expect you to put enormous values there. They intended things like, you know, a few K per meg, something like that, to go in there. Uh, if you start putting in large values, like I tried to put in things that were hundreds of meg, that single value. And it worked, but because your value size is so much bigger than the region size in each case, which is that sort of fundamental building block, it tends to work with, if it has to split one value across those, it works ish. But then you tend to get instability and some component issues around that. Now, the good, the, I guess the upside of that is rows and columns are cheap. They actually did design it to have billions of rows multiplied by millions of columns each. 
So those are simply three uses, many if you want to know, don't worry about it. So if you do have really important values, you can just look those up in multiple columns, you know, or multiple rows. That's a very easy workaround in a lot of cases. Another piece of advice, don't overextend the solar. And I'm not saying don't use solar, I'm saying there's actually something called a mid in solar. And the way that search server works is you can locate it and do it all day long and you can index it. But until you send it a commit, none of those changes are visible to other searchers. So you, you basically just can't get that data out from other search results. It's not that it's not persistent, it is. It's persistent, the data is durable and it's permanent. You just can't get it out with a search, with a query until somebody commits. And it was not designed for rapid fire commit. It was designed to say, okay, I can load the amount of data and then commit. And you'll do that once a year, once a week, once a day. You can even do it a few times a day. But if you try to do it every time you put a row or a column or some value, you basically load your whole load and you're throwing in you know, 100,000 values a second or a million a second, multiple millions a second, which is easily doable, you'll absolutely destroy the solar. So don't you know, think about putting in more than one second cost. Easy enough to just don't commit at all to your initial data to load it. Because again, saying it's durable, so that doesn't want to search it. Okay, so we, we got the data in. Now how do we get it back out? Well, again, a space is no SQL, and it's also kind of no query. So think more like a giant hash table, kind of like a fancy key value here, not a relational database, which means how do I get my data out of my case and do it get my primary key? And there are a number of actual solutions in the works to integrate things like solar and other indexing and search mechanisms. We actually just use solar. And solar to the rescue, very fast, scalable search server with built-in sharding and replication based on what we've seen. And some of the nice features got a dynamic, uh, a dynamic schema. You don't have to declare anything up front, although you can. And you can get some optimizations out there, but it's not necessary. Powerful query language, faceted search, lots of ways to put data in and out. Uh, sharding is nice. The way that works is you can query any solar server in your, any instance in your cluster. And when it receives a request, it will automatically query all of its house in the cluster, aggregate the data, and hand it back to you. So you, you can ask any of them, and you get the same answer. Asynchronous replications work because it pulls the place folder masters, which means it can either work across data centers and there's specific things like right here, which you need, need that capability just to minimize bandwidth between two clusters. At OpenLogic, we use solar farm that's sharded, cross-replicated, and we actually put up HA proxy. Anybody use HA proxy? A few people. It's really nice uh, proxy. I've read a lot of uh, descriptions of architecture for people that have favored their favorite piece of the entire infrastructure because it never goes down. It's very, very solid and reliable. We use that to load balance right across the masters, all the solar masters, and then balance threes across both the slates and the masters networks quite well. And we've indexed billions of lines of code in namespace, all indexed in solar, real-time search for a lot of different ways, and about 20 different solar fields is all indexed per source file. So it's a pretty good chunk of data, and still we get, you know, we're talking about just a few milliseconds to get fairly complex queries back from solar from all that data. Okay, good data is hard. Uh, you do need to expect to learn and experiment a lot. Because there's so many moving parts, it just takes a lot of time to get your brain wrapped around it and you're not going to get it right the first time. So I highly recommend you don't even try it. Just expect that you are going to find new ways to model your data, new ways to make the cluster work, different configuration settings, new products in. And just don't be afraid to start over once or twice. I highly recommend you make that in up front to say, okay, step one, try something, totally screw it up, watch it fall over, fix it. Step two, re-architect, try it, watch it fall over, fix it. You know, just take that right in up front. Now you can get outside help, you can get training or training, mentoring, consulting, uh, other support help, and that will certainly can keep things up. But you still gotta get your brain wrapped around all this. It does take some time. Uh, what kind of scripting languages can help? It's a lot faster and easier than writing jobs for everything, especially assisted in typecast testing. Uh, in fact, the standard H page you can where you just go in and get okay to write the database uh, is JRuby based. So we use a good amount of JRuby. There's an open source project called Wukong 
which gives you very, very easy to reduce job writing with Ruby or JRuby that's built on top of what's called Hadoop screening. This is a way to essentially not have to write job code. And so what you can do is sort of boilerplate job code, Hadoop, uh, Hadoop jobs, Hadoop jobs, can be, you know, 50 or 100 lines and kind of just menial tedious stuff to get that working, or to move on again. We're going to talk about literally one to two lines of Ruby to a job. So, a lot of years back for me, maintain, deploy, test, etc. Uh, we use a lot of Ruby, uh, and Open Logic, and Java. So there's a bunch of JRuby floating around too. We have the bridge to get nicely. The Ruby on Rails is our front end app, but we then we talk to do with Solar, Java, and REST. And we actually have Luke doing some hybrid JRuby. So I think it works well together. So here's an example of scripting languages. This is, if you haven't seen this, uh, simple example before I used to do this in Java 1. Uh, simple Java class just filters out some strings. So I created an array list and I put more strings into it. I created an instance of my filter class. All this filter longer than method, which basically just throws out anything longer than the length I did it. I print the, the list of the, the size of the resulting list. Hit the iterator with that new list and print it out. And then at the bottom, the actual method, filter longer than just creates a new list. Iterates with the old one and says, hey, here. This string less than my maximum length, okay. Put it in your list, return one of them. So 27 lines, pretty dense, a lot of ceremony going on. Or the same thing in JRuby in four lines. Where again, print list of four strings, iterate over them, find the ones that match my criteria, put it in the size of the list, iterate over it, print out each one. Or in Ruby, almost identical because Ruby is very similar to the most side Ruby. So four lines in the job, so which is better one? Four, two, one, four, two. I forgot my glasses. My two and a half metres. So a lot of you right here in Newtown are going to be this for my A couple things about using public cloud for big data. If you do decide to go that route, you can use EC2, you can use EDS storage, but that's pretty much only remotely or something like that. So if you've got big data, even at 10 cents per gigabyte a month, and you've got like 100 terabytes of it, $120,000 a year, not cheap to rent this. You're also going to need double extra large instances. So you can get up to that roughly 32 giga RAM at once for reasonable performance of the new game space. And for that, you get 13 compute units. So 20 instances at dollar an hour, by the way, they just brought that price to a dollar an hour, but about 20, so that's not even uh, running that all year is 175000 dollars a year. Now I can do reserve instances where I pay them up front. So if I give them four thousand dollars a year up front for each of those, then I can buy my hours only thirty-four cents or eighty-six thousand dollars a year operate. Of course we're maintaining company up front, but that would be the purpose of using public cloud. I know this, right? I can buy the hardware to something else without money. So my totals for 20 virtual machines. First year cost I got to send the extra 80000 in addition to the storage and the operating cost, 286000 a year. For the extra second and third years, another 206 for a grand total average of $232,000 a year. Or I can buy my own. I get 20 Dell servers, 12 cores, 32 gig RAM, same amount of disk. I get 33 compute units instead of 13, so I get two and a half times the computing horsepower for $53,000 a year. <coughs> You can say, well, okay, so I can get 20 instances of Amazon, 13 units, 232,000, or 660 total units, 53,000. So I get two and a half times the CPU power as a quarter of the price. You say, well, that doesn't include hosting maintenance costs. And that's true. If I can't figure out how to host it for $180,000 a year, 20 boxes, I should really be fired. And by the way, don't think this engine goes away. No, you still have to do all that. You still own the monitoring, still own the support, all that kind of stuff. But everything is the hardware. It doesn't go away. So you might just dance on a little more like that. Over time. Unless you like to spend money. That's another reason to think of big data being not sensitive. If it's not now. Uh, another tip it's not possible without open source. I mean, if you look at all the pieces, it's not just the top level, each base. So do solar, but the things they use, like Apache and Comcast, and keep your days across the internet covered, and the things those rely on, including the things they together, like the smart and the data reviews, and all that good stuff. And then there's all the utilities under that, and the OS under that, and dozens more. 
Please don't want all these kind of logical questions. If I have just two, this is all the bias of it. And you're not going to get the commercial providers. Final uh, few tips is expecting to fail a lot. I mean, there's the easy things like power supplies and hard drives, but also motherboard. You're going to run into kernel panic reasonably frequent, frequently, even with i 6 u 6 30, 4 type kernels. You get zombie processes, you're going to get drop packets even after you fix all the internal energies and upgrade the BIOSes. So it happens. Um, a new data node can fall over. It takes region servers and just fall over. RG servers stop responding. More servers, but I don't know they fall over. So don't be surprised when this happens. It takes tests to happen. Uh, you're going to screw it up. You're going to have straight map reduced jobs, especially when you get learning. Weird corner features in your own data will cause things to fall over. Just get used to it. Expect to be this guy at some point. You can see that. Basically, you're going to have some nasty debugging. Um, I think it's somebody else who put it to me last, to me last week. Just the occasional shit sandwich on fail for it. It will happen. You'll have those moments. It is all still cutting edge. There is a single point of failure around the node to do, for example, something called an end functionality, which has kind of been in the works for a couple of years. Still kind of in the works. Still kind of getting there, not quite ready yet. HBase, there's things like backup and replication and connected solutions that are still in flux. No clear winner. Solar also has a number of competing solutions around cloud like compatibility. They're trying to merge solar and Hadoop, and there's a number of ways to do that. There's real time indexing, fault tolerance techniques, things like Kata. So there's a, a bunch of competing ways to do this right now. There are no clear winners yet here either. So you have to watch this thing. It changes all the time. Uh, even ways to try to integrate the computer in the solar. So I, I'd like it to say, to say that this is a lot more mature and it's kind of ready to go and we have absolutely no questions. Anybody can do this. It's just not the case yet. You have to expect to put some pretty significant time in. And this may point you to a little bit of a rev back. You may not want that to be in your head. But this can be bloody. It's really easy to in at this point. Alright. That didn't scare you all. You really can't host big data in your own private cloud. You can get through it. Um, the tools are available today that simply did not exist a few years ago. This is actually Google. And it's very fast to prototype. Production readiness is what takes a longer time than all the kind of tips I've given you or, or mainly around that. You can get it up and running with cluster and it's up and So expect to put this time and training support messing things up. I find the public clouds are great for learning, experimenting, testing. I mean, you can use Elastic Map or just Amazon right now. Um, you won't get age based. But you can play with things very quickly. You can fire up the cluster, or you can do it on your own box. You can run a lot of these things in standalone mode on a laptop. They're great for burst versus sustained load. If you've got a lot of vacation and you're going to punch on it 24 7 365, you can do it a lot cheaper yourself at this point. Watch out for latency issues in public clouds. And kind of final thought is you also need small data. I mean, SQL knows that SQL do to it just easily. We use both. We use MySQL and Redis, HBase, Solar, and Memcache, all in one session. So, best tool for the job does not be only hammer that you have in HBase, just like you said at the same time. Okay, any The, the numbers I use for Amazon versus Dell by yourself or each for 20 inch machines or 20 inch. Any other questions?
Yes, it was a lot of pain. It was probably like a trip and down my forehead or something. Um, it did take a long time. The bucking technique, I would say it felt a lot more like trial and error than anything sophisticated to me. It was kind of like, okay, what is the next problem I'm running into now? What does that look like? And the, the most painful ones were kind of echoes in your pockets, more like firmware files and things that feel like they're totally out of your control when it works. Because you don't know what the hell to do about it. So we spent a lot of time Googling Yellow forums and other places and finding out that they were not very good because they're either censored or watered down. And going to the specific hardware vendors like Broadcom site to look at their forum where people have to be dishing it out, they'll turn out to be an easier place to find fixes for some of those problems. And we actually found that there were drivers, for example, released by Broadcom and Dell was not contained. It's like, oh, we get that next year, so that's not very important just because we go to sleep each load, it's not a big deal. So, I don't know, I, I think it's more just PSI work than anything. I, I, don't, I don't think I can point to anything brilliant. Sorry. Yeah, how long that? Yeah, I, I just, that's the most interesting tip is don't stop at the Dell site or any particular site. Go to as many related places as you can. We, we found a couple nuggets where, you know, this one guy saying, oh, and by the way, I work for them, and quit, and I'm pissed off, and here's what you really need to know. And so you can eventually find a solution to see. Anybody else? 